Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. Nazi treasure. You're going to want to check it out, uh, history.ca for more information, but you're also going to want to check out the interview. We, we, we went deep. We talked about, once again, some pretty interesting things, fascinating uh, series about art, about World War II, about history, and how those things are connected and what, what the Nazis were, were all about when they were uh, making their way uh, through through Europe, basically looting by purchase. That's one of the phrases that comes comes out of the uh, out of the series. The greatest heist in history, as James will tell you. The scale of this is just remarkable, and so you're gonna you're gonna want to find out more about it. You've probably heard about this before, kind of like me. And I think the first time I ever heard about it was in Raiders of the Lost Ark, believe it or not. But um, it 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 goes deep. We talk about the veil of secrecy around it for over seventy years and possibilities of immortality what is what does this have to say about about the nature of evil and the irony of why it was important to the nazis to make this theft this looting look legal we talk about greed and hubris and arrogance and a whole lot of other things so do stay tuned for a fascinating uh, interview with james and with steve and don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and my speaking and face to face live.ca as well for uh, a host of other interviews and, and and if you're interested we now are getting supporters on on uh, patreon.com if you feel like uh, you're 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 into what i'm trying to do here at face to face i would certainly love your support we do have some costs we do have some things that we have to pay for to make this happen i would certainly appreciate you coming on board and there are gifts i mean come on how cool is that so check us out uh, you can get to to Patreon by searching Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com, or through face to face live dot CA. And don't forget to Rabble dot CA as well for more information there, more writing, podcasting uh, about things that matter. Coming right up, James Holland and Steve Gamester. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by two very special guests here with us today to talk about a new TV series coming out, premiering on the History Channel very soon. That's history.ca. We've got James Holland and Steve Gamester here today to talk about hunting Nazi treasure. James, Steve, thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you know, it's, it's always such a pleasure to be able to step into other people's worlds like this. And even though we haven't met face to face, and I, I apologize for that. I think that was our, that was our original plan. You know, the irony of my podcast is it's called face to face, but often it's, it's, it's a, it's a digital introduction. It's a digital meeting, but it's really is quite remarkable to be able to step into these other worlds. So thanks for that. And congratulations on the series. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So, so why don't you give it? I mean, hunting Nazi treasure. It sounds fairly self-explanatory on a certain level, but give us give us a little bit of an overview. Can you do that? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, this is a story about the greatest heist in history and the biggest treasure hunt the world has ever seen um, during the Second World War, and in fact, beginning before uh, the Nazis systematically looted an entire continent. Um, artwork would be the most famous thing that they stole, but they also stole tons and tons of gold, uh, cultural artifacts, um, even home furnishings. Uh, you name it, they stole it. So we, this series, is exploring the greatest theft in history and exploring the idea that um, perhaps 100,000 artworks and, and billions of dollars of gold and other treasure is still missing to this day. So we want to find out why the Nazis did this, how they did it, um, who was involved, what's still missing, and can we find it today and return it to its rightful owners. So we do that over eight separate episodes looking at different aspects of this very, very big story. Yeah, and I can tell you that the scale of this theft is just absolutely unbelievable. It's, and it's not just the obvious stuff. It's not just gold. It's not just famous works of art. It's, it's really 
some quite small nuts and bolts of everyday life as well. So, you know, it's, it's clearing out any Jewish apartment in Paris, for example. Right. Um, you know, we're not just talking about tables and chairs. We're talking about fixtures and fittings, literally being like a swarm of locusts and just the cupboard is bare at the end of it. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. So it so it really plays like kind of a, a, a pri- private eye, uh, you know, a Raiders of the Lost Ark like kind. Of, there's a there's that edge to it for sure, you know. Uh, there's that shot of I forget who it was, but sort of crawling into the Gurin's cavern there, the the underground bunker, which by the way, creep, yeah, that was Connor. Creep the hell out of me, by the way. I could I could never have, have done something like that. That's for sure. But but there there there's this there's this you know you 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 somebody refers to this veil of secrecy and that's exactly what you guys are in the business of doing it seems to me in this series you're you're peeling back those layers to say hey there's this whole other world out there that maybe we we there's a whole lot more we need to find out about yeah well i think you know certain parts of world war 2 are very familiar we yeah. you know we know about we know about kind of you know bombing we know about d-day we know the kind of you know swastikas and evil nazis and all the rest of it but it's a kind of a hidden history here and and in more ways than one um and it is just fascinating the the scale of it and you know part of it is practical because hmm. actually nazi germany was very resource poor they they were stuck in the middle of of europe they didn't have access to the world's oceans they didn't have much shipping you know how do they get stuff to keep the war going how do they keep get food how do they get gold how do they get oil all these kind of things so part of the fevery is just entirely practical you right. know they're short of stuff they need it so they take it but part of it is just greed as well right. and a lot of it is is just taking stuff because they can because they're living in this kind of fantasy la la land where you know they're the gods and they can do what the hell they like and so you have hitler kind of taking this huge interest in art and and amassing this enormous collection from some of the great houses of and homes of of Europeans all across the continent um and ditto for hermann goering as well i mean it's just you, you know hermann goering you know while he should be focusing on the evacuation of dunkirk and destroying you know trying to stop the british from evacuating and and then the battle of britain his mind is not on that his mind is you know, he, he's licking his lips, rubbing his hands right, together right. and going to visit art galleries in Amsterdam and telling people that he wants X, Y and Z. I mean, he's wrapping he's of... wrapping gifts for his wife of small art finds from from around Europe. Exactly that. When frankly, he's got better things to be thinking exactly. about. Yes. Tell me, talk, talk to me a little bit about how you guys got involved. I mean, there must have been a fascination just from a historical perspective, obviously. And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the job or the, 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 the goal of what a, I don't know, a good historian is, is all about. Like, what, what, what are you doing here for me as the viewer? Yes, it's interesting. It's fun. It's, it's fascinating. It's, it's engaging and compelling for so many reasons, just from a sort of a, you know, like I said, a Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of, kind of, angle but there's got to be greater implications and and you know yeah the, 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 yeah. the rap suit he is and um one of the things i think is is really interesting is you know you just we've all seen shots of palmyra being kind of butchered by by is and and it's a reminder of uh i mean you know you have to sort of you know what what is what is where, do, where does art fit into our, right. our history and, yeah, our, and our on our wider story? You know, it's it's very important. It's a it's an indication of the development of culture and all sorts of stuff. And, and art and great art is kind of in a way for for everybody. And when you're taking it, you're 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 effectively sort of raping the country that you're taking it from. It's got wider implications. And you know, you look at Palmyra, you look at what IS have done there, and you see these sort of horrible echoes. It's completely kind of different in some ways. But there are horrible similarities as well. So the point of the series is, is that it's fun and entertaining and you follow on the investigation. It's detective work and it's, um, you know, you're, you're going to multi locations, four continents, 13 countries. You're going from kind of snowbound Soviet um, um, old Russia to, uh, to the deserts of southern Tunisia. Um, but there is a kind of serious point to it as well. You know, this stuff does matter. It is important. You know, no regime, no um, no ideology should be able to kind of, you know, plunder in this way. It's and in terms of, you know, the, the approach to that, um, you know, speaking from a producer's perspective, I mean, you hit the nail on the head in terms of 
what do you look for in terms of um, you know approaching a topic like this? And as a producer, the first thing you want, um, I mean, obviously you want to make something that's entertaining that people are going to watch. But when you're, I think, approaching the topic of the Second World War, in particular, you know, this topic, which touches upon some pretty serious subjects, you know, the Holocaust, um, sort of war as an ideological background, and of course the war itself, which killed tens of millions of people, you know, you need to make sure that whoever is relaying that information um, does it in a way that's responsible, that's knowledgeable and entertaining, that is going to keep an audience. So, you know, it was a real conscious effort for us from the beginning to find investigators who could do that. Right. So we put together a team of, of, of three um, presenters, of which, you know, James is one of them, um, who we knew could do that in a way that was uh, going to be enlightened, that was going to be responsible, that was going to put things into context. So, and each one of them brings sort of a different thing to the table. Uh, so, you know, James, as a historian of the Second World War, we knew that he could put everything into context for us. He could explain to us what was going on in the war when the Nazis stole this or did that, and how does it all fit into this big picture. Um, we also have one of the other uh, presenters is Connor Woodman, who's the guy you see crawling into right. Herman Goering's right. underground bunker. You know, Connor's not an expert in the Second World War, but he does have a base knowledge in it. And he's an investigative journalist who's done quite a bit of work investigating sort of financial crime. And, you know, in a sense, what this series is, is that it doesn't, it's not about the same old battles and generals in the Second World War. In many ways, we treat the Nazis like a criminal mafia. Right. You know, like a gang of thieves who are plundering and looting. And, uh, you know, Connor brought that expertise to the table in terms of, um, you know, understanding how criminal networks work and investigating them. And then the other investigator is Robert Edsel, um, who runs a foundation called the Monuments Men Foundation and wrote the New York Times bestselling book, The Monuments Men, which George Clooney optioned and turned into the Hollywood film. So Robert is, uh, you know, a, a, um, an expert in the Nazi looting of Europe specifically, and has, his foundation has a track record of finding and returning missing objects. What? So, you know, each person was cast with a specific reason sure. in mind to have that very active credible investigation into something that happened 70, 75 years ago. Yeah, you weren't just a bunch of private investigators getting together to find out who stole some, some goods. There's, this, this goes a little deeper than that. I, I, well, I'm glad that came through. <laughs> <laughs> it comes through, comes, comes through loud and clear. Tell me, tell me what drives Robert. He's so fast. I mean, maybe you know we need him on the phone to ask him that question. But, but you know, is it, is it you know, the, the foundation? Is it, is it, is it truth? Is it, is it history? Is it about justice? Is it about all of the above? Is it about getting, you know, these, these artifacts back to the rightful owners, as he says several times throughout? Well, I think it's all those things that you've just mentioned. I'm sure Steve can add more. more. But, um, you know, Robert is an extraordinary fellow. He was uh, very nearly a professional tennis player, so he's a, a rather <laughs> impressive athlete. Um, he was then a kind of um, an oil magnet. And then while still in his late 30s, he suddenly thought, you know, this is not what I want from my life. You know, I've, I've got some money now uh, and took himself off to Italy, learned Italian, became an art historian. Um, and, you know, his academic credentials are, are pretty amazing. And he then discovered all these, um, you, you know, these secrets from the Second World War and, and what had happened in Italy. And from that led to his... Um, uh, coming into contact with the Monuments Men. And, and the Monuments Men had really been forgotten in the Second World War. And he single-handedly put them back on the map. And not only has he written the best-selling book, The Monuments Men, he's also set up the Monuments Men Foundation. He told the movie rights, of course, to George Clooney, who then made a movie out of it. And, you know, he's, he's done a huge amount, first of all, to give the Monuments Men and what they achieved. You know, these are museum curators, art historians, and the like, who were following pretty closely behind... Um, the front line, the front line soldiers, trying to make sure that the cultural heritage of Europe was was restituted right. um, in, in the wake of the kind of Nazi occupation. Um, and so he's done quite a lot to put the Monuments Men and their work back on the map and recognize what they achieved and what they did. But he's also recognized in his own investigations that this is a massive ongoing investigation, which has not ended 
in the years, you know, right at the very end and following the Second World War, that this is still a monster project and that there are still hundreds of thousands of artifacts and works of art that are missing and need to be returned and need to be found. I mean, one of the most famous um, works of art that has just hasn't been seen, uh, no absolute 100% confirmed sighting since the end of the war, but, but it sounds like it was um, from, from our own investigation during the series, um, seen in, uh, in the 1970s, is Portrait of a Young Man by Raphael. Hmm. And, wow. you know, this is, this is although it's, re it, it's painted by an Italian, it's a very important piece in Poland, and it means a huge amount to the Polish people. And the original frame still stands in the art gallery in the center of Krakow with a black and white facsimile of the original painting in the frame. Um, and it kind of rather underlines just how important it is in the national heritage of Poland. And, you know, this, this is important. It's, it's important that the monuments men be recognized. It's important that these works of art are found. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do with uh, what Robert was trying to do with them, with George Clooney and his movie and with the book is, is uh, and subsequently with this TV series as well, is recognize that work, but also recognize that there is still very, very important work to sure, be done. Sure. And anything that raises the public profile is important because people know where this stuff is. Someone knows where this is. Right. It hasn't been destroyed. It's, it's out there somewhere. It's something that really came through to me was this idea of complicity. And, you know, you get into that kind of overtly, but it's also a really subtle sort of undertone and sometimes not so subtle, this idea that wow, there was a lot of people involved here, you know, uh, playing a role, playing a significant role, bankers and, and, and historians and, and you know, uh, uh, I forget what you called them, but you talk about kind of Hitler's art police, Goering's art police that were going out ahead of, you know, and looking for this stuff and seeking it out. Can you guys talk to yeah. me a little bit about what, you know, one of the things that I, it, what, what does this say about evil? You know, that, that, you know, the line that just so resonates with me, you know, trading uh, art for lives. And I can't remember exactly who said it in the, in, in the series. Yeah, that was David Katz. Yeah. Who, uh, Jim interviewed him. James interviewed him. And he was 97 years old, um, served in the Dutch Army when the Nazis invaded in May 1945. Uh, Jewish family. His father, Nathan Katz, was one of the biggest art dealers in Holland. And he focused primarily on, you know, Rembrandt's. Um, Van or Hobama, you know, sort of big Dutch painters, one of the biggest galleries in, in all of Europe. Um, and Goering, shortly after the Nazis uh, conquered the Low Countries, walks into their gallery one day. He's essentially on a shopping trip, oh, and he's there to, uh, you know, Rembrandt's one of his favorite artists. And, and, you know, David, one of my favorite moments of the series is when. David Katz, 97 years old, who once sat face to face with number two in the Nazis, Hermann Goering, said, the only reason I'm still alive is because my family had things the Nazis wanted. So, uh, right. you know, in exchange for providing Hermann Goering with the art that he wanted, the Katz family got exit visas to Switzerland and it saved their lives. They more than likely would have died in the Holocaust if they'd, if they'd stayed behind. But, you know, to answer your question about evil, I mean, it's certainly when you, when you spend a year working on a series like this, and you're immersed in this, and certainly, you know, Jim is immersed in the history of the Second World War um, longer than, than I am as well, you know, even longer than I have been, you do tend to think about those things. And I think one of the most disturbing things about it for me, especially when you look at the case of stealing things and theft, yes. is that a lot of people saw opportunity in the Nazi system, right, 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 especially early in the war, these guys are winning the war. You want to be on the winning side. So a lot of people, and we came across quite a few of these characters, who saw an opportunity to collaborate with the Nazis because they thought they could get some kind of personal advancements. And I think that's, in many ways, what I think is most important about studying the Nazi era, is that it can. It won't happen exactly the same way, but um, these types of things can happen. There's a dark side to human nature. There's a, there's a dark side all of us are vulnerable to. And, you know, you have to stand up against these things when they happen. Yeah, um, people are greedy, people are selfish, and people are, you know, 
happy to kind of throw moral courage to one side and take advantage of a situation. And, you know, later on, post-war, they can think, well, you know, what was I supposed to do? I was just trying to kind of, you know, I was just trying to survive. I was trying to muddle right. through. You know, that's not good enough. because Like the French example you were talking about earlier, James, the, the Paris example. Where... So the Nazis, you know, one of our episodes is about looting in Paris, and the Nazis emptied thousands of apartments. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of, of Jewish apartments, and they took everything. You know, artwork on the wall, furniture, even baby toys. All this stuff was supposed to be shipped east to be given to German families that would resettle in the occupied, you know, Poland or even occupied Ukraine and Russia eventually. But actually ended up going mostly to German houses because, of course, by that stage, you know, Germany was being bombed and uh, lots of people were, sure. you know, homes and stuff and so it kind of went to went to german homes instead but these so are was, tens of thousands of apartments yeah there's tens of thousands of apartments and how many germans were well i think there was a, the, so the uh, operation was called m action and uh, m action i think was run by i can't remember if it was seven or nine germans but the number of french people that were working for them in this roundup of and um, clear out of, of jewish properties was you know thousands hundreds um you know all the major um furniture removal companies um, in Paris were involved, you know, some of which are still um, operating today. Um, and they were just clearing out these houses. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it, it defies belief. Right? Well, it, it really does. And it, I mean, it brings us back to that whole sort of the, you know, that the, the banality of evil, I guess, you know, that, that complicity and how, right. how we, we all, we're all kind of complicit in some way, I suppose. And we can extend that to today. And there's, there's all kinds of environmentally and conflict minerals. And I mean, there's all kinds of ways we could take the conversation. I love how you bring out at one point that, you know, for Goering, it was, I think, I think it was for Goering, it was important for him to make all of this look legal. I just, I mean, I laughed, oh, I yeah, laughed out is, loud. Yeah, I nice. laughed out loud. Yeah, this is extraordinary because also this is about getting one over Hitler. Because he knows that Hitler, Hitler and Goering have pretty much the same taste in art. He knows that Hitler's obsessed about it. He knows that Hitler wants to set up this kind of Führer museum. He also knows that Hitler's got scouts, you know, going ahead, looking to all these galleries and stuff. So Goering's got to get in there quick. The problem is, is, is you know, there's, I mean, so for example, the Hausstücker Gallery in, in Amsterdam, Hausstücker is, um, is, a, is a Jew. You know, Hitler can just um, appropriate all that stuff. And take it for himself. But Goering's got to get in there quick. So while he should have been um, um, making the most of it and uh, um, and um, rather you know planning the, evac you know um, trying to sh stop the British from evacuating from Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain, he's prancing around trying to secure his artwork. You know his eye is not on the military ball at all. And what he's got, he's found there's this German businessman who's been living in in Amsterdam for a number of years before the war, and he gets him to buy. Um, house stickers gallery for kind of next to nothing which he then get that which he then buys in turn off this guy middle right, right. and uh, but obviously all this is done at kind of rock bottom prices uh, and Goering takes whatever he wants um but that way this the house sticker gallery is owned by a german um a, you know an aryan german rather than a dutch jew which means that hitler's men aren't going to be able to come and get it can you I mean, get... it's, 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 the whole thing is just oh, unbelievable. It really so what, is. What Goering is doing is racing to get this gallery content before Hitler's agents can get to it first. And and part of the reason for that competition, if I understand what you guys uh, say in the film, is that Hitler was actually, I mean, he calls him, what did he call himself? The great curator or something? Or I'm the curator? Yes, exactly. Which, again, yeah, is just, just the, the, the absurdity, the irony. Um, but he was trying to create a massive art museum in his hometown. Yes, in Linz, in, in Austria, that was the idea, and, and it, was, it was about, it wasn't just the gallery, it was also completely rebuilding Linz as a city. Right, um, right. There was going to be, um, you know, this amazing kind of um, art gallery built, especially. I mean, the, the prompt for this was visiting the Uffizi in 1938 with Mussolini, and he suddenly thought, ah, you know, the Medici, you know, this is, this is how to do it, this is how to have a legacy. We still think about the Medici now. I'm going to be that person in the Thousand Year Reich. I'm going to be remembered as the founder of the Thousand Year Reich, but also for this humanitarian, but also right. being this man of culture, for giving the German people this wonderful gallery. Yeah, what did, he, be kind yeah, of, what, what did he say? I mean, he said honestly, some, honestly. Some, something like, once once the German people know how much I love art, they will too, or something like that. Yeah, something like that. What's that effect? I mean, it's just extraordinary. And the irony is, is there is now on the very site 
where this uh, Fiora Museum was going to be is now an ultra modern building with a modern art gallery. Um, and at night it glows fluorescent blue. And it's about as far removed from his image of mm. what an art gallery in Linz was going to be. And of course, done quite deliberately. And it's of kind course. of two fingers to add off. It's brilliant. The, 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 the hubris and the arrogance of all of this yeah. is just so utterly profound. One of the most striking moments is that, you know, at the Nuremberg trials, at the end of the war, the trials that were to prosecute Nazi war criminals, you know, Hermann Goering is kind of the, you know, the star criminal on the dock. And the charges are read out against him, you know, for these crimes against humanity and, you know, crimes of aggression, genocide. You know, he kind of scoffs at all those. But when they tell him he's also um, being charged with, uh, uh, cultural looting and art looting, that's actually when he became upset. He, he considered himself a Renaissance man. So when you, when you talk about the arrogance um, and the entitlements, you know, in many ways, the looting is, is a perfect example of that. Um, he wasn't the only one. You know, right, these right, it, right. some of the euphemisms that are used are quite extraordinary. You know, you talked earlier about, about every, everything seems to be sort of they had a concern in codifying it in law or justifying yes. things. One of the euphemisms often used was they weren't stealing art. They were safeguarding it. Right. Of course, you know, that, they were. that's, that's yeah. a word that came up over and over and over again. We need to move into Paris and safeguard all of the great art from the Jewish collectors. Um, of course, that's, they weren't safeguarding it, they were stealing it. Um, so there is a sense of entitlement, there's an arrogance to um, the looting by a lot of the top hey, Nazis. Wouldn't we, call, uh, wouldn't we call that today fake news? <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to go there, but yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> yeah. let's not let's not go there. Hey, we got to wrap it up yeah. in a couple of minutes, and I I hate that. By the way, I'm absolutely loving our conversation, and 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 can't wait to see the rest of the series. By the way, which is premiering uh, on History, uh, the History Channel, History.ca, and we'll be existing there uh, uh, post premiere on television. Can you guys talk as we kind of wrap it up a little bit? I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, one of the the folks involved in the film uh, in the in the series early on says something about kind of you know with a smile tongue in cheek you know maybe if hitler had gone to art school things would be different how, 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 how do you guys feel about that well you know it's so you know when you're looking at the the second world war and what a catastrophe that was it is amazing to think how many you know constantly in anyone's life you're constantly coming to forks in the road and you take you take mm. it right or you take it left and it leads yep. you down a different path. I mean, Hitler could have been killed by a British Tommy in 1914, you know, the, the, yep. the British yep. Tommy. It was on the on the, uh, uh, on the the Messine Ridge um, just to the um, southwest, of, southeast of, of the town of Ypres. They found um, Hitler, this Tommy, British Tommy, found Hitler, was about to stick the bayonet in and then for some reason didn't. Um, you know, so right. yes. all sorts of Oh, where it could have gone very differently. You know, had he been a successful painter, then, you know, perhaps he wouldn't have... You know, I mean, also, don't forget, he was a runner during the trenches in the, in the First World War, which was about one of the most dangerous jobs you could do. So, he, you know, a shell could have easily taken him out at any moment, but it didn't. I mean... Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, you know, on, on these little twists of fate, yes. it's one of the ultimate what if questions in history, isn't it? You know, would the Second World War have happened without Adolf Hitler? I mean, I... I who knows about that question? There could have been a conflict between Germany and the West, no matter what, because right, of right. you know the legacy of the First World War. But I do think that I'm not sure the looting of art and cultural treasures would have happened on the same scale if Hitler's not involved. I, I do think that that's maybe not a fair, not a conclusion to make, but certainly you know an assertion that you could make. I mean, it's precisely because he does have this huge preoccupation with art in what's considered genius, in the way he twists that with his own racial ideology mm. that, you know, Jim and I are sitting here talking about this now. I mean, that, this, that theft happens um, the way it does because of Adolf Hitler. And that is one of the most chilling moments, I think, of the series, to see Hitler's artwork. I and mean, that's, mm. that's yes. a scene that we have in the first episode where Robert Edsel goes to a museum um, just outside of Washington where some of Hitler's art is kept, not on display. They never display it. They keep it. But w the most shocking thing about his artwork, and, they, and the, you know, the curators and Robert observing it say this, in a way it's quite accomplished. The problem with Hitler's 
artwork is that he was completely out of step with what was trendy at the time. Right, right. His right. art was, you know, it was, there were no people. It was old all school. very technical, very old school. You know, he's, he's painting very technically accurate depictions of buildings and architecture. But you think about what's coursing through the veins of, you know, the European art scene at the time. It's, it's you know, it's, it's Picasso. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Ch it's, it's good. Child, what, what I love about that observation too, by the way, is it, you know, he was doing everything that everyone else wasn't, which, which was challenging the status quo, right? Which was kind of pushing back against, right? And he was, he wasn't. And, and the, and the no people observation is just utterly brilliant to me. Yeah, no, it's interesting stuff. And, uh, you know, the, the human, <laughs> you know, human beings and human emotions uh, have a big ripple effect through history. And Hitler's Hurt feelings by not getting into Vienna Art School. Well, I, it did have an impact on the history of the 20th century. I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. Well, listen, guys, thanks so much for your time. I, I hope we can do a part two. I absolutely want to talk more about the guy who stole from Hitler. I'm so sorry we weren't able uh, to go to go into his story because I just, again, I just thought that was, uh, again, deeply ironic and, and kind of absurd and hysterical all at the same time. We've been talking today to James Holland and Steve Games for about their new series, eight-part series uh, premiering on the History Channel hunting Nazi treasure. James, Steve, so appreciate your time today. Really appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you.